Good morning and welcome to the Cal Poly Strawberry Center's virtual field day for 2020. My name is Gerald Holmes. I'm the director of the center and we have a great morning planned for you. We really regret not being able to hold this meeting in person, a chance for everybody to network. It's always been such a great event. Uh, but we didn't want to let this opportunity pass without being able to extend the information that we've got, uh, gathered this year through our research. So we're really looking forward to doing that with you. And again, we apologize that due to COVID-19 restrictions, we're not able to hold this meeting in person. Hopefully next year we'll be able to do that. We have over 340 RSVPs for this meeting. So it's a great turnout as well. We've had a great response from our sponsors and I'd like to acknowledge each of them now. Our gold sponsors first, Coolpack, Summit Agro, Terramera, Good Farms, Plant Sciences, Lassen Canyon Nursery, Nature Ripe, Cal Coast Machinery, Sierra Cascade Nursery, Maxco, AgRx, Driscoll's, and Sunrise Grower, a Sunopta company. And now our silver sponsors, Bear Crop Science, Ag Biome, Syngenta, BASF, California Giant, Jane Irrigation, AMVAC, Corteva AgriScience, FireM SC by Eastman, Biotalis, Geiniger Plastics, Trical Diagnostics, Wish Farms, Titan Frozen Fruit, FMC, Nishino America, Opi, Marone Bio Innovations, Sim Agro, Agrian, Crown Nursery, Valent USA, Yara, Toro, Santa Maria Seeds, and DSM, makers of Zivion. We're almost ready to begin, but I wanted to uh, explain a little bit about today's format. What we tried to do, because we're in the virtual format, we tried to take advantage of, of this type of format, and we partnered with the California Strawberry Commission's David Navarez to add a lot more video to our presentations. So in each one of our videos, you'll notice a lot more video than you're used to. And I think of this as kind of like the Super Bowl. It's great to be at the Super Bowl, but if you're at home, you get to watch the play-by-play, -play, you get to watch the slow motion replay. And so there's actually advantages to being at home and watching the game that way. And we like to think that the same principle is at work. This isn't the Super Bowl, but same principles at work here on, uh, for this field day. So all the presentations are pre-recorded, but the question and answer sessions that follow each of the presentations will be live. And some of those people will be here with, with me, and some of those people will be joining via Zoom from other places in the state and the country. In the chat section of Zoom at the bottom of your screen, uh, you will see a link to today's handouts. So if you haven't uh, gone to that link, please uh, do so now and you can uh, follow along with the presentations. The handout packet is about 20 pages, so it'll take a little while to print that, but it would be useful for you to have that in hand as we go through each of the presentations. Uh, sometimes the text is a little small on, on these uh, graphs and charts, and so it might help you to refer to those. But if you are not able to do that now, please know that the handouts are there on our website now and always. And this, this uh, meeting will also be recorded and posted there for later viewing. Uh, if you joined a little bit before nine, you would have seen a screen that uh, discussed the continuing education units. And I wanna go over that again. Uh, in order to receive credit for continuing education units, excuse me, you need to be participating via uh, Zoom and not YouTube Live. YouTube Live will not give you the option of participating in the polling questions. 
uh, respond to quiz questions at the end of each presentation. We're gonna have one polling question and then we're gonna have one uh, question from our audience. You need to pass the final exam with a score of 70% or higher. Uh, the good news is you can take that exam as many times as needed for you to pass. Uh, you'll need to complete the final exam by September 4th. Um, and the CEU certificates will be emailed by September the 11th. So you'll need to complete the final exam by September 4th, and then you'll get an email by September the 11th. Smartphone users must use the Zoom app to be able to access the presentation material and respond to quiz questions. If you cannot see the polling questions, please follow the instructions via the link that is posted now in the chat box. Um, and a link to the event handouts again will be posted in the chat box. So we're now going to do a practice polling question so that we know how many people are out there and that you have a chance to respond to the polling questions. And that should be on your screen. And it's a question about what region are you based out of? And it's either somewhere in the state of California or outside of the state or outside of the country. So please answer the, that question now. We'll give you a few seconds to do so. Okay, so you've had a chance to enter your answers and uh, that'll give us uh, a sense of how many people are on this Zoom meeting and uh, with each of the questions that we go, get to later in the program, it'll give us a sense of when to cut off the polling. Okay, before we get started with the research presentations, we have, uh, we're gonna hear from our Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences, Dean Andy Thulin. Andy? I'm Andy Thulin, Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences. Thank you for joining us uh, virtually for the annual Cal Poly Strawberry Center Field Day. I want to especially thank all the wonderful partners who have helped sponsor this program and event today. And thanks as always to the California Strawberry Commission Board of Directors and Rick Tomlinson for your wonderful partnership uh, with Cal Poly. I want to acknowledge the Strawberry Center staff in doing an excellent job adapting this field day to a virtual format. Like all of you, we've been working hard day in and day out to adapt to the new reality brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Early, in the university, early on, the university wisely decided that essential research activity could continue. That is, research that's critical to the economic and health conditions in the state. We classified all the research conducted at the Strawberry Center as essential. And so all projects were and will continue to be completed on schedule. I picked up several clamshells of last uh, season's strawberries at our drive through retail store on campus. They continue to be some of the best strawberries I've ever had. So that's the good news. Unfortunately, as you all know, it's been a year of uncertainty for the strawberry industry. The Strawberry Commission did an excellent job of transitioning to new regulations typically ahead of the state mandates, including social distancing, hand washing, face masks, and a full education campaign, which I know Rick will discuss in more in greater detail later today. I'm thrilled to share that the Strawberry Center's new entomologist, Sarah Zukoff, will start later this month. She'll be a fantastic addition to Gerald's team. For those of you that have been out at our strawberry fields recently, you've seen the construction of our winery uh, and grain hall next door. This $22 million center for wine and viticulture is entirely supported by our industry partners and donors. The winery is on schedule to be completed this fall with the Grange Hall uh, to be completed in March of 2021. I look forward to hosting industry events there with all of you in the near future. We also are making good progress on the new Frost Research and Teaching uh, building in the center of campus. This building has seven food related labs under construction, thanks to the JG Boswell Foundation and several other wonderful donors. I wanna say thanks again to the Strawberry Commission for your ongoing partnership with Cal Poly and all of you for joining us here today. Hopefully we'll resume the in-person field day in 2021. Thank you and have a wonderful day.
Thank you, Andy. It's a lot of exciting things happening in the college, and uh, we hope that next year maybe we'll be able to hold part of our field day in that new Wine and Vit Center. And now uh, the first, the first uh, stop on our agenda is with Dr. John Lin, manager of the Automation Engineering Program. John? Hi, I'm John Lin, Production Automation Manager for the California Strawberry Commission and the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Here at the center, we work together with students, faculty and staff, and the Commission's field team to both create and validate technologies for California strawberry growers. Today we will focus on three pieces of field equipment, the Ligus Bug Vacuum, the Spray Rig, and the plastic mulch cross hole puncher. To tell you more, here's Jack Wells and Caleb Fink. Hi, I'm Jack Wells. I'm a Cal Poly alum, and now I'm the California Strawberry Commission's production automation engineer. Today, I'll be walking you through the new Lagus Bug vacuum improvements. First, here's a little background. The Lagus Bug is the most economically damaging pest in California strawberries, costing growers an estimated one to $200 million in decreased fruit yields per year. The bugs feed on the seeds of developing strawberries, causing damage commonly known as cat facing. The majority of the industry uses bug vacuums to manage this pest. A bug vacuum is a tractor mounted implement and typically covers three strawberry beds at a time. Each bed is covered by a single fan and hood assembly. The fans pull high velocity air through the plant canopy, which sucks lagus bugs off the plants and into a steel baffle located atop the vacuum's exhaust. The California Strawberry Commission's automation team began the Lycus Bug Vacuum Optimization Project in 2017. The primary goal was to increase the vacuum's total airflow. As such, the conventional narrow ducting was discarded in favor of a straight tube design. The straight tube design causes the fans to run more efficiently and therefore better utilizes the power available from the tractor. For vacuums used on 64 inch beds, the same tractor can now power two fans per bed instead of one which more than doubles the inlet area while maintaining the required airspeed. Modifications to the vacuum exhaust further increased performance. Six inch risers were added between the top of the duct and the steel baffles. This allows much of the air that flows through the vacuum to escape around the sides rather than being forced through the baffles themselves. This escape route increased wind speeds at the inlet by 20%. Although the air now escapes out the sides, the momentum of the Ligus bug maintains an upward trajectory until it slams into the perforated baffles. Studies indicated that only 2% of the lagus bugs survived the trip through the vacuum. The result of this work is the new double barrel bug vacuum, which has been evaluated to remove an average of 2.3 times more lagus bugs per pass than conventional vacuums. The new vacuum is available for purchase from CNN Tractors in Watsonville and Paso Robles, California. In addition, fabrication drawings and component listings are available online by navigating to the automation tab on calstrawberry.com. The work discussed thus far has been on 64 inch bed vacuums, typical of the Santa Maria and Oxnard growing districts. Recommendation for the smaller two row beds found in the Watsonville and Salinas areas will be provided late 2020. Thank you, Dr. Lynn and Jack. And now I'm joined live by, uh, with Jack Wells. We're gonna answer a couple of questions. And I wanna reiterate the way this is going to work uh, throughout uh, the field day today. We'll have a presentation that is pre-recorded, and then it'll be followed by a polling question. And we'll do that live or on Zoom, depending on where the participant or the speaker is. And then we'll have a question from our audience and the audience can pose their questions in the Q&A section of the chat in Zoom. And so, Jack, what's your polling question? So my polling question is, which of the following statements is not true with regards to the double barrel bug vacuum? One, the lagus bug causes over $100 million in fruit damage for California strawberry growers each year. Two, the double barrel bug vacuum removes 2.3 times more lagus bugs than conventional bug vacuums. Three, the double barrel vacuum is currently commercially available. 
or four, the double barrel bug vacuum requires a more powerful tractor than conventional bug vacuums. So all of those statements were true except one, and it's your job to find out which one is not true. We'll give you a few seconds to enter your answers. All right, looks like we have our answers in. Time to find out how the audience responded. It looks like everybody said the last option was the one that's not true. The right, double yeah. barrel vacuum requires a more powerful tractor than conventional bug vacuums. Right, so that is incorrect. Uh, so most of the audience got it correct. But uh, the double barrel bug vacuum can be used, can be retrofitted onto the tractors that our growers in Santa Maria and Oxnard are already using for their conventional bug vacuums. Okay, that's an important point because I knew right. some people were wondering if they had to have a different tractor and, and you don't. Yeah, so there are uh, parts like a gearbox that pump that need to be replaced, but your, uh, your standard 90 horsepower tractor uh, that most growers are using will work. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the, the Q&A section and uh, I don't see an, I don't see a question there. Let's see. I don't see any questions from our audience. Anything else you'd like to, to say about the bug vacuum? Uh, where can they get one, for example? So our, our industry partner at this time is CNN Tractors. So they have locations in both Watsonville and Paso Robles uh, in California. So uh, the plans are also available online, as I mentioned in the presentation but commercially from CNN tractors. Can they just can they just make them here at Cal Poly? Uh, they can make them at Cal Poly, but um, you can take the plans and if you can convince Cal Poly students to do it for you, maybe. <laughs> so it's not a, not a manufacturing. Okay. Let me, uh, what is the cost of this improved three bed model? Um, you know, it's not really up to me. Uh, yeah, if you get a quote from um, CNN tractors, they would tell you as far as the manufacturing and the, the, the components themselves are relatively similar price. Okay. So you don't really know the, what, what they're charging. Yeah, that would come to the person building it. Okay. Know. But the components, I could say there's no more than uh, 15 to 20% increase in price as far as components. A, a second question, we're gonna have to, to move on, I think, uh, given the time. So thank you, Jack. Our next presentation Uh, our next stop on our field day program is with Caleb Fink. Caleb? I'm Caleb Fink, Production Automation Engineer with the California Strawberry Commission. Today I'm going to talk to you about one of the grower's most important tools, the spray rig, and how to improve its coverage. But first, why is this important? Well, a uniform and thorough spray coverage is essential for pest and disease management. In 2018, a joint research project with UC Davis and the Commission found that spray volume does not equal spray coverage. Thus, greater volumes may not necessarily provide better coverage. Coverage depends on operator training, weather conditions, and rig design. We cannot control the weather, but we can design a better spray rig. Over the last two years, we have conducted spray trials across California's three main growing districts, Watsonville, Santa Maria, and Oxnard. During these trials, we take note of the spray parameters. For example, this spray rig uses 20 holocone nozzles, sprays at 150 PSI, and is common to rigs found in southern growing districts. We also measure the rig's coverage with water sensitive paper. From this industry-wide survey, we've identified critical elements that affect spray coverage. This includes spray height above canopy, pressure, number of nozzles, and type. 
replicated and randomized field comparisons found that a closer to canopy spray height achieved better coverage irrespective of the other critical design elements. And that for four row systems, eight Conejet TXR80036 ceramic nozzles operating at 111 PSI performed the best out of all the designs tested. To date, three out of the three grower rigs who adopted a portion of the four row recommendation achieved between 10 to 30% improved coverage over their conventional rig design while operating at the same tractor speed and volume per acre. Designs of a four row rig will be posted in the fall of 2020. Designs of a two row rig will be made available in the future of 2021. All right, we're joined now live with Caleb Fink, and we have the polling question first, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please enter that question in the Q&A section of Zoom. So Caleb, go ahead and uh, give us your first polling question. So which of the following statements is not true with regard to spray rig optimization? Answer one, increasing spray volume will increase spray coverage. Answer two, Lowering nozzle height to adjust above the plant canopy improved spray coverage irrespective of rig design. Answer three, eight cone jet TXR80036 ceramic nozzles per bed operating at 111 PSI performed the best of all four row spray rig designs tested. Or is it answer four, growers who adopted a portion of the four row spray rig recommendation saw a 10 to 30% increase in spray coverage. Okay, so again, one of those statements is not true, and the other three are true. Your job is to find out which statement is not true. We'll give you a few seconds to enter your answer into the polling section of uh, Zoom. All right, looks like we have our answers. And uh, our audience is saying that the first one is the one that's not true. Increasing spray volume will increase spray coverage. 82% of our respondents wow. said that. Cool, great. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Um, by increasing spray volume, it does not necessarily mean you will increase your spray coverage. Um, a study with uh, UC Davis' uh, Nan uh, Christian Nansen, um, you know, uh, just because you put more product out there does not mean you will increase your coverage. Interesting. That's sort of counterintuitive, right? Right. If you're going to put more volume, more liquid out there, wouldn't you get better coverage? How, how do yeah. we explain that? Uh, you, you would think so, but that's just not the case. Okay, uh, not so, necessarily the case. So up to a point, and then there's a point of diminishing returns. That's right. And so what is the optimum? What have you dis, uh, found is the optimum spray volume given your new configuration? Um, that's a great question because that's uh, what what uh, our next protocol will be. We'll be testing it out. We don't we don't know for sure what the optimum spray volume is, but we will be testing it out shortly here. Okay, great. Um, so it's time to move on to our next presentation, our next stop on the program, and that'll be with uh, Dr. John Lin. John. Poly Strawberry Center, we have the Automation Help Desk, where growers can sponsor a team of students to work on a project for them. Now here's Jack Wells, he's going to tell you about one of our recent projects, the Plastic Mulch Cross Hole Puncher. In the Santa Maria and Oxnard growing districts, hole punchers are driven through the field immediately prior to planting. Hole punchers are a tractor mounted implement with four spike covered wheels that roll across the top of the plant bed. The spikes cut the plastic mulch and leave tapered holes in the soil at a predetermined spacing. The holes increase the speed of hand planting and minimize risk of plant damage. Conventional hole punchers leave narrow cuts in the plastic, which can prevent adequate water and sunlight from reaching a young strawberry plant. In some cases, this leads to plant death and increased replanting rates. To combat this, some growers utilize hand labor to make a cut perpendicular to the existing slice, opening the hole and allowing more water and sunlight to reach the plant. 
This process is estimated to cost $100 per acre. In 2019, two local strawberry growers requested the Automation Help Desk produce a cost-effective solution to this problem. The cross hole puncher was developed at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center and is the direct replacement for conventional hole punchers. The implement is three point hitch mounted and rolls under its own weight. Spikes can be customized to produce the required cut pattern and cut depth and the plant spacing is easily adjusted. The cross hole puncher is inspired by combine harvester and hay rake design. The spike reel is driven such that the spikes are oriented vertically at all times, allowing the cross fins to cut the plastic without scooping large amounts of soil on exit. During the final round of field testing in June of this year, the grower sponsors were satisfied with the results and planted 2,000 plants on rows punched with a new implement. Pending results of plant health and establishment in that block, the cross hole puncher may be used on several hundred acres this fall. Following the format of the Lagus bug vacuum release, specifications and assembly instructions for the cross hole puncher will be available on the automation page of the calstrawberry.com website by late 2020. I'm joined now by Dr. John Lin. John, that's an exciting new development. Uh, you have a polling question for our audience? Yes, I do. Uh, which of the following statements is not true with regards to the cross hole puncher? One, manual cross hole punching is performed by some growers that help with plant establishment. Two, the automation help desk projects are led by teams of Cal Poly students. Three, design, designs of the automation help desk cross hole puncher will be made available online late 2020. Four, anyone can submit a project idea to the automation help desk. All right, so three of those statements are true and one is not true. Your job is to vote for the one that's not true. We'll give you a few seconds to input your answers. Just a few more seconds. All right, we have answers now. It looks like every, well, it's a pretty even across the four answers, yeah. John. Uh, the highest percentage, 31% voted for that last one. Yeah. Is that the one that's not true? That's, that's correct. Um, yeah, this was a, this was a thinker. Um, essentially, you have to be a California strawberry grower to submit a project to the automation help desk. So it's a requirement. Okay, so what if I'm not a grower, but I'm in the strawberry industry? Uh, you, we are focusing on growers right now. That's the, that's the primary, uh, uh, target for the, the California strawberry commission and the Cal Poly strawberry centers, uh, uh, automation program. So we want to, we want growers. We want to assist growers. Okay. So if you're somebody who wants this to happen, you need to partner with a grower maybe. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We do have a question from, uh, a viewer on YouTube live. It says, uh, where will the specifications and assembly instructions be available? Will they be available online? Yes, they will be. Uh, so currently we have uh, designs for the Ligus bug vacuum with Jack Woes that you just heard about online. It's gonna follow a very similar format. Uh, so it's gonna be online. There's gonna be uh, CAD drawings of all the components. There's gonna be assembly videos. Um, there's gonna be some basic instructions. Uh, it should be any fabricator should be able to assemble it and, okay. and fabricate and assemble. Great, and, and what's the timing on that? Uh, we're targeting by end of year, Okay, uh, end 2020. Of, end of 2020. That's correct. Excellent. Well, time to move on to our next uh, presentation, John. Yeah, thank you, Gerald. Um, so our next stop is actually right outside. So if uh, you join me, I'll meet you there. More than ever, strawberry growers are looking towards technology for solutions. That's why we've invited three of the leaders in automated strawberry harvesting 
to provide you a brief update. Hey guys, it's Kyle Cobb from Advanced Farm, coming to you today from foggy Oxnard, California. Thanks a lot to the commission for letting us tell you more about our company today, and we look forward to seeing you all in the field soon. This is Lewis Anderson, I'm CEO of Traptic. We are solving the problem of labor shortage and rising labor costs with robots. We've raised millions of dollars from top venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. We use that money to hire the best engineers in the world. And our team has developed three critical things. We've developed a patented gripper, which is capable of grabbing berries delicately. We've developed an intelligent vision system which is capable of looking at plants and berries, deciding which ones are ripe and figuring out a bunch of other aspects of the plant. And we've built a durable robotic platform that's capable of operating in the harsh environment of a farm. And finally, we've demonstrated that this system together is capable of picking berries at very high quality. We've had an exciting year. We're into our fifth year of field operations. And most importantly, we've been running every day for the last one and a half years of that. We've demonstrated the ability to run all day, every day, for long periods of time. That means we're out picking berries continuously. We've tested in every time of year, every field condition, a whole bunch of different plant varieties, every major geographic area. We've tested in early season, mid season, late season. We were out in Oxnard through late May. Uh, we've been in Watsonville through late September. And most importantly, we figured out a way to safely and reliably harvest every berry on your ranch for the same or lower cost than what you're paying now, and in a way that increases your yield overall. Luckily, the impact of COVID on Traptic has been fairly minor. We have implemented standard safety procedures so that we're following industry best practices. Most of our team transitioned to remote work. We've been able to continue field operations like before. So we're still out there picking berries in a commercial farm all day, every day. We are starting large scale deployments very soon. So if you're a grower, come talk to us about doing a commercial deployment. We're getting a lot of interest and we would love to fit you in. Send me an email at lewis at or shoot me a call or text at 760-845-8171. Come talk to me about how we can help you harvest every berry on your ranch for a fixed cost per tray. Thanks. At Harvest Crew, we're at the forefront of automated agricultural harvesting services. And we have set our initial growth target on the $3.6 billion US strawberry market. We have created a modular robotic vehicle that automates the harvesting and packing of strawberries. Each harvester has 16 independently working robots outfitted with our vision system and vision AI. With our vision system, each berry on a plant is scanned to determine if it is ripe, healthy, and ready to be picked. With one robot per plant, 
Each robot has six picking claws made from FDA silicon rubber and set to pick a berry without damaging the fruit. With six picking claws per robot, there are 96 picking claws ready to harvest as the harvester autonomously navigates its way through acres of strawberry fields. Through the eyes of our vision system's dual cameras and played back at half speed, this video helps to illustrate the immense amount of information that is being processed in real time. Here, the targeting system identifies ripe berries and their coordinates to ensure exact placing of the picking claw. Played back in real time, the plant is scanned, then the berries are targeted and picked within eight seconds. During our spring 2020 field testing, we added our berry transport system. This modular add-on carries the berries from each of the robots to the top of the harvester for inspection and packing. For the first phase of on-harvester packaging, a small team of quality control personnel perform a final quality inspection and pack individual clamshells. With our harvester mounted LiDAR system, we now have 360 degree, three dimensional data of the fields, plants, and all objects below and surrounding the harvester. This allows for more precise navigation down rows of strawberries and provides 3D view to the harvester so that it does not collide with growing rows, people, and other obstructions that are in the harvester's path. This spring, our harvester is field testing two to three days a week in our Florida fields. Our team is monitoring the performance of the harvester as a whole and each of its subsystems to evaluate performance and determine methods for improving accuracy, uptime, and to identify cost reduction measures. While the harvester is impressive in itself, once you get under the hood and witness the flurry of robotic activity, you begin to see the huge impact automation will have on the agriculture market and how harvest crew is ready to scale and fulfill the needs of farmers with this extraordinary set of technologies. To learn more about Harvest Crew and discover how we are about to revolutionize the strawberry industry with our innovative technologies, please visit harvestcrew.com. Thank you. Wow, that's some pretty exciting technology there. Um, so now we're joined live uh, with uh, Kyle Cobb, co-founder of Advanced Farms, uh, coming in from Sacramento. Uh, Lewis Anderson, co-founder and CEO of Traptic, coming in from San, uh, San Jose. Uh, and Joseph A. McGee, executive chairman and CEO of Harvest Crew Robotics, coming in from Ireland, the, the furthest uh, attendee, I think, uh, uh, to this event. Um, so yeah, thank you all for uh, coming in and uh, uh, sharing that, that update. Um, so 2020 has been a pretty uh, unique year. Uh, I think uh, every, every company, everyone has been uh, reacting to COVID. So uh, the question that I want to ask or start us off with is, uh, uh, has COVID changed your timeline or goals in any way in, in the rest of the year and, and even into 2021? So let's start off with uh, uh, Kyle Cobb. Yeah, hey, thanks, John, for, for having us. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for listening in. Um, I guess what I would say is, you know, we took to COVID as a chance to uh, learn from our grower partners. I mean, we're always really impressed with, uh, with the resilience of strawberry growers. And this was no exception. I think the industry more or less took it in stride, though it certainly impacted everyone. And it was nice to have a uh, front row seat to understand how an industry and a world-class organization uh, you know, like Good Farms, for example, one of our key grower partners uh, handles that sort of thing by putting people first and safety first and, and showing up every day. And I think that's, um, that's what we, we tried to do was uh, show up and, and contribute um, what we could to, to the harvest process. Uh, we are, um, you know, out there uh, every day picking hundreds of pounds of berries uh, over the course of the, of the season. And we look forward to going out uh, and doing the same thing next year. So timeline was um, was sort of right on track, and and, and uh, thanks again to uh, some big help from our core partners. Okay, great. So no delay. That's great, um, uh, Lewis. Yeah, and thanks also for uh, organizing this. Um, I would also say it hasn't changed our timelines at all. 
Um, you know, we're lucky enough that we're able to, our engineering team is able to work really effectively while being remote. Um, and we're also able to continue operating every day like we were before. Um, so you know, we're able to um, continue doing a great deal of testing, uh, keep operating every day. Um, our engineering progress is progressing really well. Um, so yeah, I'd say it's, it's been a challenge, but uh, luckily it has not um, changed our timelines at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Joe. Hi, John. Uh, thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah, we we just like uh, Kyle and Lewis, uh, we we haven't actually seen any slowdown in timeline. If anything, we've seen increased interest and more pressure to accelerate development. Uh, you know, one of the challenges, obviously, COVID impacts the availability of labor, which is a significant issue. But what we've also found is the whole food and safety. Um, our design does not actually touch the strawberry with human hands. And the whole COVID-19 has kind of heightened that, uh, that issue of the food and safety. So we're seeing a lot of pressure from people to accelerate the timeline rather than pushing it uh, back. Uh, so yeah, no, no impact on our schedules. So uh, we'll take some uh, questions from the audience here. Uh, so how does uh, each machine treat unharvestable or coal fruit? Um, and, and feel free um, to just uh, uh, answer uh, as, as, the, as it comes to your mind. Yeah, I'd say one of the great things about what we're doing is, uh, you know, we've heard that a lot of the uh, human pickers tend to take those berries and throw them in the furrow. Um, and with automated harvest, you have the opportunity to be really diligent about getting those out of the field. Um, so you can get them out of the field and into a trash can or, or some other way of disposing them that won't spread as much disease and will really help keep your, um, <clears throat> help keep your field a lot cleaner, um, which will over time increase the yield of your crop. Um, so this is one of the many ways that we are seeing that automated harvest can, um, and, um, automation as a way to augment your existing workforce can really increase the yield of your field overall. I'll just add to that. I, I think Lewis, um, it, we're not, we don't think about this that differently. Uh, he summarized it well. I, I think the only other thing that I would say is uh, as if you, if you go back and watch our video, you'll see that we, we put fruit into a, uh, an RPC that can then be uh, sorted after the fact. And I think that's one thing that, that you know, humans do really well is sorting uh, fruit by quality. And so that's, uh, that's done in, a, in sort of a secondary step. And I think it, uh, it, it sort of enhances the quality of fruit coming out of the harvest process. Yeah, guys, I would, I would echo that. Uh, maybe one of the differences is we actually have a secondary inspection vision system, which is part of a National Science Foundation. So our vision system will pick the strawberry uh, and then we'll do a secondary 360 inspection of that machine and then we can actually sort based on the quality algorithms that we use and we will collect both uh, the packable berries and the kind of culled berries on the harvester. I think yeah, the, the question that we've got from the growers is the issue of clearance. You must clear the field even of the, the poor strawberries. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we do have another question here. Um, uh, do you foresee um, asking the grower to change their grow system, possibly to something more similar to a substrate system to assist uh, uh, your, your, your automation um, approaches? I'm happy to start on this one. You know, I think we always, uh, we were always really focused on, on going to, you know, where the market is today and, and, and where the, uh, the, the problems are today. And that seems to be uh, mostly in soil. Uh, we're certainly working closely with grower partners to optimize uh, in soil growing conditions. Um, and of course we welcome all ideas and, and, uh, and opportunities to collaborate. But for now we're really focused on uh, trying to, to go to the grower and, and solve the problem as it exists today without asking for a, a big investment in, uh, in changing practices. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. We're, we're following a very similar approach. You know, we're, we believe strongly that when we deploy our service, <clears throat> it needs to improve the economics of the growing operation overall. And so number one, we're making sure that we uh, run this um, as a service and that we charge a, a fixed price per tray that's the same or lower than what you'd 
pay with a purely manual solution. And we, we are um, seeing that there are ways where we can increase the yield of the field overall, really help the, the grower get more revenue per acre. Um, and so, you know, we're also making sure that we don't add any additional costs so that overall there's a strong economic case for deploying this quickly. And so deploying in kind of traditional soil harvest, I think is a, a really important aspect of making sure that the economic case works out for the grower. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but uh, you can uh, continue to ask questions uh, in the Q&A and, &A and uh, uh, the panelists might be able to uh, get back to you directly. And feel free, the, uh, the, these panelists, um, all of their contact information um, will be made available on the agenda or on, 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 the, on our website. Thank you. Thank you back to you, Gerald. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right. All right. Our, our next stop on today's agenda is a master's student who's finishing her second year of research, Camille Garcia Brucher. Camille? My name is Camila Garcia Brucher. I'm a second year master's student here at Cal Poly in the Horticulture and Crop Science Department. My advisor is Dr. Charlotte DeCock, and she comes from the Natural Resource Management and Environmental Science Department. And I'm going to be talking to you about our project, the effect of preplant fertilizer on four strawberry cultivars. Strawberry growers are ahead of the curve when it comes to managing their nitrogen fertilizer applications. They can do a lot of these applications through their drip irrigation system so that they can precisely time fertilizer with the crop nitrogen needs. Um, if a grower uses a preplant fertilizer, it is often one of these slow release fertilizers. And the idea is that this fertilizer slowly releases plant available nutrients over the course of the winter. However, some research from the UC Cooperative Extension suggests that this release pattern is not as slow as we might think. And in fact, a lot of the nitrogen is released before the plant uptake is significant. So we need more research to better understand the fate of the nitrogen in this preplant fertilizer. So we wanna know the effect that preplant fertilizers have on yield, disease incidence and plant mortality, and the crop and soil nitrogen dynamics and whether or not these three things are even affected by the preplant fertilizer, or perhaps they're more a result of cultivar, or maybe even an interaction between the two. Our project takes place in field 35B at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center, which was inoculated with Macrophemina phasolina in 2017. The design is a split plot design with two treatment factors. Our first treatment factor is the preplant fertilizer application, and this is what determines the blocks. So some of the blocks contain 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre of Cal Poly certified compost, 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre of AgRx polyurea coated control release fertilizer, and the rest of the blocks are control treatments that didn't get any preplant fertilizer application. We chose to use compost because it's currently being incentivized by the CDFA Healthy Soils Initiative to build soil health. And our four cultivars are randomized within our blocks. So we have Monterey, San Andreas, and Albion, as well as Driscoll's proprietary cultivar. Our methodology for the yield data is pretty straightforward. We basically just harvested the fruit ourselves. Um, we harvested each plot individually. So there are six individual plots per bed. Um, so each plot got its own crate. And then once we finished, we weighed that crate to get the yield in total pounds of fresh weight. Once a week beginning in May, I began conducting disease incidence observations. So we do this by creating a scale of disease severity between zero and five. Zero indicates one of these healthy, vibrant green plants and five would look like one of these completely dead brown plants. Um, so I just walk the field and assign a score to each plant in the individual plots and then summarize the total amount of dead plants per plot. So this gives us the disease progress over time. Um, once we have these numbers, we can conduct a statistical analysis called the area under disease progress curve. And this is a statistical summary of the disease intensity over time. 
In this video, Morgan is holding one of the instruments we use to collect our soil nitrogen data. This is called a Rhizon pour water sampler, and this one in particular was installed at a depth of about 14 inches or approximately below the root zone. So these long sensors are essentially lysimeters. Um, so they have that porous ceramic tip and they're just used for research because they draw smaller volumes of water compared with the lysimeter. We also have smaller versions of these installed in the root zone at approximately eight inches. So every two weeks we come and collect the water from in between the soil pores by attaching a syringe to the samplers and then creating suction by drawing the plunger of the syringe, which allows us to collect the water from down in the soil pores. This sample then is taken back to the lab and analyzed for mineral nitrogen, which are um, nitrate and ammonium. Eventually, we'd like to create our own nitrogen uptake curves for the cultivars in this trial and to see if there's any differences across treatment or cultivar. Um, so to do that, we collected destructive plant samples once every four weeks beginning in early April. So we, we would randomly collect two plants per plot and cut the above ground portion of the plant off and then go back and collect the roots by using this bulb planter, which extracts the roots in an equal volume of soil. Um, the above ground vegetative portion that Morgan already cut off, I take back to the lab and trim the leaves off and then cut the stems and crown separately into smaller pieces. And these organs get dried in an oven and then eventually ground up and put on an instrument in our lab to analyze for carbon and nitrogen. So this is my first result slide. For most of my slides, I use the same color coding. So the blue bars will always be our compost fertilizer treatments. The gray will always be our control and the brown, the control release fertilizer or CRF treatments. Um, our yield results were determined taking, by taking the total yield in pounds and dividing it by nine pounds to get pounds in trays and then ultimately trays per acre. So for both the 2019 and 2020 growing seasons, we saw a significant effect of cultivar on our yield result and we did not see any effect of pre-plant treatment. Our area under disease progress curve analysis shows that in 2019, we saw a significant effect of cultivar on this result. We did not see any effect of pre-plant treatment. In 2020, not only did we see different statistical results, but we also saw greater disease. This is because the area under disease progress curve analysis takes into account disease intensity over time. So we saw some severe plant death in early June in 2020 compared with early July back in 2019. So that's why you see a lot more disease. We don't yet have all of the other 2020 data to explain why we saw a significant effect of treatment in this year and not of cultivar. Right now I can only share the soil nitrogen data from the 2019 growing season since we're still processing the results from the 2020 growing season. Um, in 2019, we did not see any significant effect of pre-plant treatment or cultivar on the amount of nitrate in or below the root zone, but we did see consistently greater concentrations of nitrate below the root zone compared with in the root zone. It's important to note that the beginning of this field season, the soil residual nitrate was quite high. It was at 75 parts per million, and I believe it was down to 20 parts per million at the beginning of the 2019-2020 growing season. If you recall the video earlier in the presentation of Morgan taking that destructive plant sample, um, I mentioned that we took these plant samples roughly once a month or about every four weeks. So we did the same thing um, to get some fruit samples. So about once a month, typically on around the same time we took these plant samples, we took our fruit samples so that we could also analyze the fruit for nitrogen concentration using the same methodology. Um, our results suggest that there were differences in fruit nitrogen concentration based on cultivar, but only in the early and final months of the growing season. And these results are only for 2019 we are still analyzing the crop nitrogen data for the 2020 growing season. 
The red dotted line on this graph shows the nitrogen removal conversion coefficient according to the draft ag order 4.0 um, from the regional water quality control board and they got their data from um, UC extension research. This final result slide has the cumulative nitrogen uptake in our plants for the 2019 growing season. We saw a significant effect of cultivar on the cumulative nitrogen removal in fruit and the nitrogen uptake in above ground vegetation as well. In addition, above ground nitrogen uptake was significantly greater in the control treatment compared to the CRF treatment. Um, it's important to note that overall our fruit nitrogen removal and above ground nitrogen uptake in this experiment are a lot lower compared with some of the literature out there and we think this is due to the disease pressure that this field faced. In summary, long-term compost application is known to build soil health, but there are also some known risk to compost application. In this particular experiment, we applied the Cal Poly certified organic compost, so we were able to do this safely without any negative effects on yield or plant disease and mortality. It's possible if you have fertile fine textured soil, such as what we have in field 35 at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center, it may not be necessary to apply a synthetic pre-plant fertilizer as it does not show any benefits. Like most crops, strawberry nitrogen requirements are affected by yield, vegetative growth, nitrogen concentration in fruit, and nitrogen concentration in vegetative biomass. Our results show these factors were affected differently by cultivar and preplant fertilizer treatment. So this has implications for optimizing the rate and timing of fertilizer applications in the strawberry production system. With me now is Camille Garcia Brucher. We have time for a polling question and a question from our audience. Go ahead, Camille. Yeah, so we have a question about the results from the first year of this project. So based on the results from the 2018-2019 growing season, in what zone did we see greater soil nitrate concentration? Is it number one, below the root zone at a depth of about 14 inches, number two, just in the surface soil, or number three, in the root zone at about six to eight inches? All right, we'll give you a few seconds to enter your answers. Remember, if you have questions, to put them in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to those right after the polling question. Looks like we have our polling questions in, and the greatest response, 57%, was below the root zone, 12 to 14 inches. Is that the correct answer? That is correct. And that makes sense, right? Because nitrates are very mobile, very mobile in the soil. So it's often um, leached down quite quickly, especially depending on your soil type. So that is correct. Excellent. Good. It's glad to see the audience is getting these right. Um, we have a, a few questions from our audience. I think we only have time for one, though. Uh, your yields seem, let's see. Can you expand on why you think that you saw significant treatment effects on disease in 2020, but not in 2019? Yeah, I thought this question might come up and we don't yet have a solid answer to that. And we're also still processing a lot of the data from the year 2020. So we don't yet have the soil nitrate data for that year, um, as well as the crop nitrogen data. And we don't have the inoculum data yet for macrophamina phasolina. So we're still processing that. And so far in the literature, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that perhaps um, something treated with CRF that might have more nitrate would affect the uh, incidence of macrophamina phasolina. So that's in the works. All right. Uh, I know there's several more questions here. Uh, we'll have Camille respond to those uh, on her time, but we need to move on to the next presentation. Um, and next up is Dr. Moshtaba Mansouripour. Moshtaba? I am Mushtaba Mansur, Research Manager at Plant Sciences. 
I'd be presenting work I did as a postdoc at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center and evaluating host resistant to Macrofemina crown rot in strawberry. Macrofemina crown rot or charcoal rot is one of the major soybean diseases of strawberry. So Macrofemina phasolina is causal agent of this disease, which loves heat and high temperature. So we conducted this experiment at Cal Poly Strawberry Center. And I'm gonna talk about trial design at first, and then I'll talk about the method of inoculation that we use. And then I'll talk about evaluation method. At the end, I'll discuss the results. So we conducted this experiment in random complete block design or RCBD with five reps and 20 plants per rep. Four rep were inoculated and one rep were, was non-inoculated or untreated check. This fifth rep or untreated check was bed fumigated with Ali 33 at 534 pounds per acre on October 7th, 2019. Then we transplanted field on October 23rd, 2019 with 65 genotypes from six breeding programs, including University of California, University of Florida, Driscoll's, Plant Sciences, Lassen Canyon, and California berry cultivars. Here you can see the location of Macrofemina field and Cal Poly campus, which is close to the Strawberry Center. And in this side, you can see the closer look of the field. And in the left side, you see the inoculated side of our experiment and at the right side you see the non-inoculated uh, side of our field or fumigated side which separated by two buffer rows. We inoculated field two weeks after transplanting and we used five gram of cornmeal sand macrofemina inoculum we put this inoculum around the crown and then cover that area with soil in order to increase disease pressure and induce the disease we started to do drought stress from june 13th and drought stress means withholding water no water from friday till monday during the weekend from june 13th till end of experiment which was on august 3rd we evaluated field every two weeks from December and I count number of dead plants and those plants considered dead, which was 100% all foliage necrotic. So, and we also sample plots and beds by random to make sure they are dead because of Macrofemina phasolina. In this slide, you can see the way that we go through plot to plot, bed to bed, to read the number of dead and number of life plants. And here you see example of plots, look in this one, at least 50% of plot dead. And in this slide, you see some plants with brown leaf, but those are still considered life plant because they have still have green foliage. And here you can see these, all these plants are dead. And here you can see the difference between diseased and healthy plant from crown section. You see the diseased plant crown section is discolored by the but the by microfemina, but then the right one, the healthy one is is good. So here in this graph you see our results. On the x-axis you see plant mortality percentage, and on the y-axis you see the name of all 65 genotypes. So, and you see we have resistance at the bottom all the way to susceptibility at the top. So, and each one has an error bar which shows variation within rep for that specific cultivar. And if the bar is longer, means higher variation and bar is shorter, lower variation, more consistency. So, here at the bottom, you see Mariposa UC Davis 
CBC and PS9271 from Plant Sciences. So you see these four show 5% and low, and at the top you see Radiance, Ruby June, University of California, and Lassen Canyon, which shows 90 and above percentage mortality during this experiment. In this slide, you see the same genotype, the same experiment, but they sorted based on breeding program. And you see in each breeding program, they have both resistant and susceptible. So they have all of them in their material. At the end, uh, why we conclude that a wide range of susceptibility we have among the genotypes and of breeding program. And we also have high level of resistance to macrofemina crown rot, which is a useful source for breeders to transfer those resistant to new cultivars or their new popular commercial cultivars. At the end, all thanks to California Strawberry Commission and NIFA SCRA grant to fund this project and also all breeding programs involved in this project, including University of Florida, Driscoll's, Plant Sciences, UC Davis, Lassen Canyon, and California Berry Cultivar. At the end, thank you for your patience and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Moshtaba. Moshtaba is joining me live via Zoom from Watsonville. And so Moshtaba, you have a polling question and then we'll take questions from our audience. Go ahead and uh, go ahead with your polling question. So my polling question is, which one of the following is favorable condition for Macrofamina phasolina? One, high temperature. Two, insufficient irrigation. Three, poor soil conditions for all of the above. All right, so we'll give everybody a few seconds to input your answers. I feel like we need to play some Jeopardy music or something. All right, here we go. We have the answers here. It looks like 92% of the respondents said all of the above. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Because microfamina loves heat. So high temperature help microfamina to show symptom. Insufficient irrigation and poor soil conditions cause stress to the plant. And stress, one of the major things, can help microfamina to, I mean, show, to plant show the symptom when microfamina attack. So all of above is correct answer, 92%, I mean, answer correctly. Right, great. I have a couple of questions from our audience. Let's, let's do uh, at least one of them. Moshtaba, is there a fitness penalty for resistance in the case of resistance to macrofamina in strawberries? Um, Maybe you could describe what a fitness penalty is first. Means if we see any resistance, there is something, some other trait that could uh, that could reduce. I mean, when we have, sorry, I can explain that correctly. When we have a resistance, we sacrifice something else to have that resistance. Is there any fitness penalty? So. If I'm, uh, uh, I should say it, it is possible to have a fitness penalty for that resistant to microfamina. And then in the, if you see some, and yeah, you, you, can, you can see some fitness penalty to, for resistant to microfamina. So it's possible but we yeah. don't know of a fitness penalty. We haven't identified one. One, yeah. But it's it possible, this is, it could happen. We, but we, we don't uh, study that. We don't know that, that if there is any. Okay, we have time for one other question. <clears throat> and this person asks, what would you think about 
how you can control macrofomina without chemical fumigants in the future. Can Is host resistance a good a good way of doing that? I mean, the, and one of the big things, the major things you can do, develop the cultivar that show resistance or tolerance to macrofomina. And the other things besides fumigation is crop rotation, which is not, which is not 100% uh, controlled microfamina, but crop rotation with broccoli, ASD also, Arabic uh, soil infestation could help, but those are not hundred, uh, not gonna hundred percent control microfamina. But the major thing that we can consider is using resistant or tolerant cultivars. Okay, uh, thank you, Moshtaba, and thanks for the questions from our audience. It's time to move on to our next stop. And for that, we're going to Omar Benitez Gonzalez Benitez. Omar? Hello, my name is Omar Alexander Gonzalez Benitez and I am a staff research associate at the UC Davis Strawberry Breeding Program. Today I'll be talking to you about our Anthracnose trial, where we screen 105 cultivars and elite breeding lines in the span of two years. I first would like to say that I am currently a UC Davis employee, but all this research was done when I was doing my master's with the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. Now what will be my presentation is, I'll introduce Anthracnose, I'll then go over the objective of this experiment, I'll do materials and methods and how we got our ratings, our results, and then our conclusion. Anthracnose is caused by Calatotricum acutatum. Anthracnose is an economically important disease because when present, it can cause high plant mortality. Anthracnose has a broad range of hosts. This includes almond, apple, pines, and some weeds. Some symptoms that characterize anthracnose are necrotic and blight symptoms on plant leaves, petals, flower, or even roots. Now this is seen by image number one, where you can see the necrotic and plant collapse, eventually leading to the death of the strawberry plant. Anthracnose also causes fruit lesions on ripe fruit. You can see this on image number two and number three. The image number four shows the fruit lesion zoomed in where it shows the anthracnose spores. Other symptoms that characterize anthracnose are dark brown and black sunken lesions on petioles and runners. Now in all these three images, you can see a, a set of petioles and runners that are infected and sunken, with sunken lesions and some necrotic spots. During the 2015 and 2016 strawberry season, there was an anthracnose outbreak leading to high levels of anthracnose in fields. This occurred in the Santa Maria and Oxnard area. Now in the image in the right, you can see a field with anthracnose symptoms. Because of this outbreak, it led to this experiment and the, the objective of studying 105 cultivars in the lead breeding lines and screening them against anthracnose. Our materials and methods, this experiment was conducted at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. In year one, the trial was conducted at field 25, block three, as shown by the arrow. The trial initiated October 23rd of 2018 and was terminated on April 29th of 2019. For year number two, this experiment was conducted at Field 25, Block 8, as shown by the second arrow. The trial initiated October 23rd of 2019 and the trial terminated on April 29th of 2020. The experiment layout was a complete randomized block design. In year one, we had a total of 76 cultivars and in year two, we had a total of 59 cultivars. Now there were a total of 30 cultivars that were used in both years. Each cultivar consisted of four inoculated reps and one non-inoculated rep. Each rep had a total of 10 plants. Now for inoculation method, there was a total of three local isolates of anthracnose used. Now in image number one, you can see anthracnose growing in lab on media. Image number two shows the aftermath of when we harvest the spores for the inoculum. Bare root transplants were sold for one minute in 100 milliliters of anthracnose inoculum. Here in this video, you can see us pouring the inoculum into the bags. 
and then we seal and shake the bags for one minute. We make sure that all the plants get soaked in the inoculum. And then soon after that the plants are soaked, we then take them into the field. And once in the field, we set them into, the, into its designated rep and plant. Our ratings occurred in a weekly event. We took plant mortality assessments where we counted the number of dead plants in each plot. From there, we got percent mortality. The picture on the left shows high percent mortality. The picture in the middle shows medium percent mortality. And the picture on the right shows low percent mortality. Here's a video showing our plot layout. This video was taken in July of this year and it shows the experiment. You can see some of the cultivars that are susceptible and some that are resistant to the anthracnose. You can see some susceptible cultivars that with high plant mortality and some with low plant mortality as well. Now our results, we had first symptoms of anthracnose three weeks right after planting. And that's when we started taking plant mortality assessments. Now the majority of the plant death occurred by January in both of the experiments. The breeding programs that were involved in this experiment were University of Florida, University of California Davis, Plant Sciences, Planasa, Lassen Canyon, and Driscoll's. Now here I am showing you plant mortality in year one. Plant mortality is on the x-axis and on the y-axis you can see the cultivar and the lead breeding lines. Here I'm just showing you how in each breeding program there was a wide range of susceptibility and resistance to anthracnose. With the arrow, I am pointing at Monterey, a cultivar that is widely used in industry. It is close to 100% mortality. Now you can see that some of the programs had 100% mortality, and there were some of the programs like Plant Sciences that had a 0% mortality cultivars. Here, I am showing you the data for year two. In the x-axis, you can see plant mortality, and in the y-axis, you can see the cultivar and the leaf breeding lines. Again, in all the breeding programs here, you can see that the susceptibility and resistance among all cultivars had a big range. In this year, Planasa did not participate in the experiment. Now I'm highlighting cultivar Monterey, and you can see that it's at 100% plant mortality. Now this year, there was no cases where any cultivars had 0% plant mortality. I am now showing you the two-year data of the 30 cultivars that were in both years. Here you can see the black graph shows the 2018-2019 season, and then the gray graph shows the 2019-2020 season. You can see cultivars like Victor and Monterey that are right at the very top with high plant percent mortality show the cultivars had very similar results in both years. But then you see cultivars like Del Rey, which is a third down of the y-axis, or others like Ruby June, which is a third from the bottom of the x-axis. You can see that they have over 50% um, difference in both years. This is important because it shows that it's important for a breeding program to conduct experiments more than two years. Now for management practices, first I'll go over pre-plant. It is important for nurseries to use good sanitation practices because this can lead to using disease-free plants. Other ways that you can manage anthracnose is by fungicide dips immediately prior to planting. Now the number one way to manage anthracnose is by using host plant resistant, resistant cultivars. After planting, if anthracnose is in your field, the best way to manage it is by avoid using overhead irrigation. This is important because anthracnose loves, the anthracnose spores love to spread through irrigation. Another thing is practicing good field sanitation practices. This includes removing weeds, infected plant material, and infected fruit. It's important to remove them because through irrigation, they can spread easily if, the, if those plant material are infected and in the furrows. Another thing to do is IPM and scout fields. This can help you identify any hot spots in the field, and then you can accurately provide foliar application of fungicides to help minimize anthracnose spread. Thank you. Omar is now joining us live from 
Oxnard, California via Zoom. Omar, welcome. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead and read your polling question? Okay. <clears throat> if you have identified that there's antagonists in your field, what are some steps you should take in order to prevent a spread in your field? Avoid using overhead irrigation, practice good field sanitation, or all the above. So we'll give everybody a few seconds to enter your answers. Looks like we've got the answers there. It looks like everybody selected your all of the above answer. Is that correct, Omar? Yes, that's correct. All right, let's see if we have any uh, questions from our audience. It looks like we have one. <clears throat> Omar, why do you think your results do not align those observed at the University of Florida? Is it because of the wide difference in environment? Or could it be different races of Calatotricum? Yes, yeah, so it can be both. Um, I know in Florida, um, the weather over there is more humid, so more prevalent for anthracnose. Um, and then in our case, we use uh, anthracnose isolates that were local from California. So we collected those all around California. And I assume that in Florida, they use isolates that are from our Florida. So they're more used to the cultivars over there. In our case, the, I mean, the probably the University of Florida cultivars are not familiar with the isolates here. And so that's why there's a big difference in that. All right. Um, what about stunting? Can you can the pathogen stunt the plants without killing them? And did your particular rating take that into account? Yeah, so my rating did not take that into account because I was just doing percent mortality where I was just counting the plant was 100% dead where it was completely necrotic and no, no green leaves. So I did not take something in, into account. But with when in the field walking and, and doing my ratings, I did see some stunting of some plants that were still alive, but you can say they weren't 100% um, um, yielding how they should in terms of the strawberry plant. Okay, so that's the, the a two-year study that you did as your master's program. You're now working for the University of California uh, Davis breeding program. So congratulations to you. Thank you. It's time to move on to our next stop on the agenda. And uh, our next presentation will be by Kyle Blauer. Kyle? Hi, my name is Kyle Blauer. I'm the field research manager at the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. I'll be reviewing the results from our 2020 fungicide efficacy trial for controlling Botrytis gray mold. The cultivar used in this study is the ever so popular Monterey planted into your standard raised bed. This is considered a small plot study replicated four times with five spray applications over a four week period. Prior to the first application, we remove all pre-existing fruit from the trial area, leaving only the flowers. We apply the products with a handheld backpack sprayer. After all the applications, I'll ev evaluate these treatments by determining the level of botrytis incidence in the field and collecting fruit for a post-harvest evaluation. This is an example of what the post-harvest evaluation might look like. We store them at room temperature and monitor them every two days. The tray on the left is switched with a weekly rotation of captan, and the tray on the right is the non-treated. The idea here is that all the fruit are similar in ripeness, a little white shoulders okay, but definitely no bruises or rot. So jumping to six days after harvest now, your eyes are probably immediately drawn to all the rot on the non-treated tray, but there are actually six berries on the switch rotated with captan side. This is a dramatic difference here with only three berries on the non-treated tray that do not have gray mold. This would statistically separate and I would classify switch rotated with captan as an effective fungicide treatment. And that's the purpose of this trial is to find treatments that statistically reduce the level of botrytis gray mold to not spraying at all. I'm going to run over what you received as part of your field handout titled fungicide efficacy trial against botrytis gray mold. I'll start with the green graph titled early season 2020 
Note that the X axis is only set to 45 here. I reduced it to help show some differences between treatments. And dropping in the field evaluation, in this case, it was three days after the final application. And we see pretty low pressure. The non-treated in, in the red box only had an average of 2.7%. The yellow or gold box is a treatment we put in all our botrytis trials. We also refer to this as the grower standard. We know that switch is very effective for controlling botrytis fruit rot and captan is widely used. So this is a benchmark as a standard treatment. But you're not gonna see any statistical letter codes because nothing statistically separated. The disease pressure was just too low and that was partially due to the warm weather and little rain during the trial. And frankly, that happened all year long. Now looking at the post-harvest evaluation four days after harvest, we see statistical separation and there are actually two treatments at the top here that did sig significantly lower the amount of gray mold relative to the non-treated. Moving on to the yellow graph from the handout, this is the peak season trial. Note that the x-axis has changed to 70 and we can see the low pressure in the field evaluation again. The non-treated in red was at 1.8%. To put this low pressure into perspective, usually I like to see at least 10% here. I want to test these products in extreme conditions. And to increase the disease, I will use sprinklers to prolong the leaf wetness. But when it's warm and windy, it really doesn't matter how long those sprinklers are on for. The sun and wind will evaporate that water quickly and not create a conducive environment for botrytis to grow. It's all about prolonging that leaf wetness to get a lot of botrytis in your trials. There was even one treatment here that yield 0%, but we still don't see any separation because there was also one rep in the non-treated that yielded 0% botrytis. When the non-treated has 0% in one of its reps, it's impossible to separate the treatments. But this is what happens sometimes in field trials, and there's really nothing you can do about it. Looking at the six days after harvest, there was some, one treatment that was significantly separated at the top of the graph. It may appear that this trial had higher pressure, but that was because this data is from six days after harvest, not four like the early season. If we were to look at the other evaluation days, nothing statistically separated. So that's why I chose these two dates. I get this question a lot of why we store these at room temperature and not 34 degrees like a commercial strawberry grower. And that's because mold doesn't grow at low temperatures very rapidly. We want to test these products in extreme conditions and there's nothing more extreme than leaving your berries out at room temperature overnight. What's next in your handout for this talk is a fungicide efficacy table. I just have the few first lines on the slide so we can see them clearly. We compared data from our fungicide trials that we have conducted over the years and we are working with the University of California to update the table located on the UC IPM website. Each fungicide gets an efficacy rating, four pluses is the max. NR means that that particular pathogen is not listed on the label. In some cases, we have found some level of control, so you'll see NR in parentheses with uh, some pluses as its efficacy control level. ND means no one has tested it for this pathogen yet. Ideally, if we want to continue to update this, I would like to see no NDs on this table. The superscript Rs mean we have recorded resistant populations from strawberry fields throughout California or confirm the results here at Cal Poly. This table is subject to change when officially published by UC. You'll be able to tell what version of the table you're looking at by the Cal Poly logo and date on the bottom corner. Ideally, we want to be on the same release time, but we wanted to get this data out to you so we have released it early. And lastly, the plan for next year is probably two more fungicide trials for Botrytis gray mold. I think we'll assess to see how much of a problem rhizopus and mucar rot are in the industry because there's not a lot of products that can control it. So we want to help get registration if this is a regular problem. 
but the first step is to see where this path pathogen is. I know we can get it here at Cal Poly, especially during the warmer late summer months of the year. For the next round of efficacy trials, I wanna come up with an inoculation method to help further separate treatments. I'm not gonna leave it up to mother nature to create a good disease pressure environment. So I think that would add a lot of value to these trials. We can also look at resistance at the same time as these trials are going on and continue monitoring the change in populations. All this information we are gathering would be updated in that fungicide efficacy table I just talked about. That seems to be the easiest way to relay our findings is in that table. And thanks for taking the time to listen to me today. Kyle Blauer joins me live now here in San Luis Obispo. Kyle, go ahead with your polling question. Yeah, my question is, what do we use as the grower standard in our botrytis efficacy trials? One, non-treated. Two, there is no standard. Three, switch rotated with Captan. Or four, a weekly rotation of Elevate, Kenja, Switch, Maravon then switch again. We'll give you a few seconds to think about that and enter your answers. All right, looks like we have our answers in and 75% of the audience says that it's switch rotated with Captan as a grower standard, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Switch is uh, an effective fungicide and captan is widely used throughout the industry. So a weekly rotation of that seems to be a, a good standard. So it has the potential to change based on how the industry is, uh, you know, uh, controlling botrytis. But for now, it's a uh, switch rotated with captan. Okay. Um, excellent. We have a couple of uh, grower or questions from the audience. Uh, what do organic strawberry growers have as options for this disease other than cultural management practices? That one might be referring to the previous presentation, but it applies here to botrytis as well. Yeah, what so are the organic options? There are some organic options. Um, it can be the ones that are registered for California are on that table I talked about towards the end on the uh, second page. Also in your handout, you'll see um, down at the bottom there's efficacy ratings for uh, common strawberry diseases, powdery mildew, uh, botrytis granule. Okay, so refer to that uh, University of California efficacy table, right? Yeah, and there's uh, going to be products that we didn't get to, or they may have similar active ingredients. So you may see, um, you know, a, a trade name on there that shares a similar active ingredient with another that's not listed. So we mostly just keep to the same active ingredients on that list. Okay, I think we're ready for well, our next stop. Yeah, and our next stop is actually by our director here, Dr. Gerald Holmes. Gerald? I hope you're enjoying our virtual field day so far. As you can see, this is not a Zoom virtual screen. This is an actual strawberry field during harvest. My name is Gerald Holmes. I'm the director of the Strawberry Center, and my topic today is Botrytis gray mold. The worst thing that can happen is the grower puts all the effort into growing the crop, harvesting the crop, cooling and shipping that crop only to have problems with arrivals. So what we did is we looked at the conditions in the field as they relate to post-harvest occurrence of botrytis. Things such as temperature, leaf wetness duration, rainfall, and fungicide application timing and frequency. Let's get started. Botrytis fruit rot is the most important fruit disease of strawberries worldwide. And it's a really easy disease to diagnose and to find in the field, except when it's hiding underneath the calyx, like you see here. You see the calyx is wet, that petal got stuck there and the moisture got trapped and eventually that will decay. Botrytis is everywhere and it's just looking for an opportunity. And no matter how good the pickers are, no matter how conscientious, some of that will escape detection and end up in the clamshell. It's unavoidable. The most common way that the disease is managed is through the use of fungicides. This is a very expensive thing to do. It doesn't always give us the results we want, and we wish there were more reliable means of controlling the disease. 
Each year at Cal Poly, we conduct fungicide performance trials against botrytis. And one thing we've noticed is that some years there aren't, isn't very much disease. As a matter of fact, uh, out of the 10 trials you see here, only 2017 was there a relatively high level of disease. Look in 2018 in both the spring and the summer, there were no disease in the field. So we decided to do a survey because we think that maybe we're spraying fungicides more frequently than needed. We thought that if we looked at the incidence of post-harvest botrytis by simulating commercial handling practices, we could get a handle on this, knowing that some of the botrytis is gonna sneak through and get into the clamshell, right? So we wanted to know when the peaks of botrytis fruit rot occur on a commercial level in relation to temperature, rainfall, leaf wetness duration, and the fungicide programs. To do this, we set about doing an industry-wide survey in all three districts, starting in January and up to the president. We selected 12 sites, four per district, and at each site, we have four sampling locations where we take four clamshells. What that ends up giving us is 16 clamshells or two trays. And I'd like to thank our, the collaborators, Dan Lagarde and his team, uh, Miriam, Daniel, and Ignacio, as well as the growers and PCAs who are letting us in their fields to do this work. Not to mention uh, also here at Cal Poly, our students and staff, especially Dr. Hewa Vitharana, who is leading this project. Here are the 12 sites we selected, four in each of the three districts. There's different varieties and different growing practices. I wanna point out the three pairs, one pair in each of the districts. In Oxnard, we have the same variety, Fronteris, but with different growing practices. In one case, conventional and the other organic. And you see that repeat with Monterey and Santa Maria and with Plant Sciences 9271 in Watsonville. So this is how the assessment works. You start with those two trays with eight one pound clamshells. Those come directly from the field and are immediately transported to Cal Poly. At Cal Poly, they're put in an incubator at 34 degrees Fahrenheit for seven days. That is the standard storage temperature for strawberries, but seven days is longer than most uh, the longest shipments. Coast to coast shipments are about four days, but when we tried that temperature, we weren't getting any decay, so we needed a little more sensitive assay and we extended the storage period to seven days. After the seven days, the fruit are assessed for the presence or absence of botrytis. Just to give you a benchmark of the amount of decay that one would likely see, this is a pallet with 108 trays of the one pound clamshells. And what's typical in a cooler is the quality assurance team will take a clamshell at random from the bottom layers, another clamshell from the middle layers, and a third clamshell from the upper layers. And they'll take those, and assuming that those clamshells have 20 fruit per clamshell, there's more larger fruit in the beginning of the year and smaller fruit at the end of the year, but 20 is a good average. Now, if you found two fruit in those three clamshells of 20 fruit, you'd be exceeding the USDA number one standard for decay. Actually, two in 60 is 3.3% decay. Okay, so with that behind us, you know the methods. What are the data? So we have two ranches here in Oxnard. The blue will use the same color scheme throughout. The blue is the organic and the red is the conventional. Uh, the USDA number one standard is there at 2% for reference. Now let's take a look. That's the conventional and this is the organic. And this is the most dramatic out of the three regions where you see a big separation between organic and conventional. And when I say organic, I mean no fungicides were used in this case. We, we know that there are there are organic fungicides, but in this case, no fungicides were used. So in three different instances, the levels went way above and 15% you know, 
incidence of botrytis is, is huge. Now looking at the incidence of botrytis as it relates to rainfall, the rainfall is the blue line and the botrytis incidence are the gray bars showing exactly what you saw in the previous graph, but now in relation to rainfall. This is the conventional field. So rainfall there uh, at two or three instances. And now the other, uh, the USDA standard there at 2%, and this is the organic field, showing again the rainfall coinciding with the incidence of the disease. Let's go now to Santa Maria. Same thing, ranch G is in red, ranch H is in blue. Uh, you can see that the conventional stayed below the 2% the whole time, and also the organic stayed low. Only in one instance did it rise above 2%. Now, if we look at that in relation to the rainfall, that blue line, you can see there was rainfall early, but it really didn't amount to much disease in the conventional. And you'd think that that might be because they're fungicide, but in this case, it looks like the organic had just as low as the conventional. Looking at Watsonville Salinas now, the organic again in blue and the conventional in red. And you can see just basically neck and neck throughout the entire season. So it didn't matter in this case if you uh, used fungicide or not, or it didn't matter very much. Okay, looking at the rainfall in relation to that, you see that again, the bars stayed relatively low. The rainfall came mostly ahead of when the disease was, which makes sense since that's the, when the flowers are infected. This is the organic farm, same exact uh, rainfall because these fields were very close to each other. Okay, so what do we make of this? There's more work to do, but our initial observations are that the botrytis levels are very low most of the time, but with some important exceptions. The fungicide application was really not associated with botrytis fruit rot levels during periods of little to no rainfall. And that most importantly, we believe that there's potential to dramatically reduce fungicide application without affecting botrytis levels. So from here, we need to take closer look. We're still collecting data on fungicide use. That takes time because of the county reporting systems. But we think that there's a story here to tell. And at the end of the day, where we're going is we think that we will be able to dramatically reduce fungicide application without affecting botrytis levels. And that's pretty exciting. Thanks, Gerald. We're back to answer a couple questions. And Gerald, will you uh, review your polling question? Okay, my polling question is a pretty simple one. It's a true false question. If fungicides are not applied, Botrytis fruit rot will cause major losses regardless of weather conditions, true or false. I'll give you just a few seconds. All right, and it looks like most people answered false. Is that uh... The correct answer? Right, that is the correct <laughs> answer. <laughs> it was not, it, depending on weather, right? The, the weather is really important for botrytis and there were lots of periods where we just didn't really measure that much disease, uh, more so than there were disease, right? So it just suggests to us that there might be a way to save fungicide sprays and not really sacrifice our control of that disease. And uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so let's move on to the next stop. Yeah. All right, our next stop is with one of our graduate students, Michael Palmer. Palmer, I'm a second year graduate student here at the Strawberry Center, and I'll be talking about host resistance to powdery mildew, as well as fungicide resistance development in powdery mildew. With that, I wanted to thank you all for joining today, and we'll go right ahead and hop into the presentation here. 
Just a quick outline of the presentation. We'll begin by talking about the fungicide resistance trial, and then we'll move on to discussing the host resistance trials. So fungicide resistance. The fungicide assay starts when I get a sample. And so I either go out and collect this sample myself, or I get it from a PCA or from someone at the commission. And it's always some sort of infected plant material, whether that be uh, leaves or berries. And uh, if it's all from the same field, then I label it as a single isolate for the fungicide assay. And then once I get this sample, I go out into our fields at the center and I collect folded Monterey leaflets. And it's important that they're folded because that's when they're most susceptible to mildew infection. And then I go ahead and I take those leaflets and I sterilize them in bleach for three minutes to ensure that they're clean. And I put them on this device called the Anderson Spore Cascader, which is essentially a vacuum with perforated plates that allows me to distribute the spores evenly onto the clean leaflets. And I then brush the sample through the cascader onto the clean leaflets. And this is just to standardize the amount of inoculum because when I get this sample, I have no idea how old some of the mildew is or how dense it is. And so this helps me have a standard amount of inoculum for the fungicide assay. I then take those inoculated leaflets and put them in a growth chamber at 20 degrees Celsius in 16 hours light, eight hours dark. And then after 14 days, when that inoculum is built up, I'm able to go collect more clean leaflets and treat them with fungicide. So here I am taking newly collected and sterilized Monterey leaflets and dipping them in their assigned fungicide treatment. These are the six treatments used in the fungicide assay. The FRAC codes represent the mode of action of each product. And so products that share the same FRAC code have the same mode of action or way of controlling the fungus. And the six treatments were selected to represent a diversity of FRAC codes. Each treatment was applied at the minimum labeled rate to highlight resistance in any of the isolates. And each treatment consisted of three reps and one rep was defined as three treated leaflets on a single plate of auger. And then when I have these treated leaves, I put them in the Anderson spore cascader. And then I take those previously inoculated leaves that have been incubating for 14 days and I brush them onto the treated leaves. Now the treated leaves that have just been inoculated go into the growth chamber for 14 days at the same conditions. And after two weeks, they are evaluated for disease incidence. Here are a couple of representative plates of what the leaflets might look like after 14 days of incubation. On the left here, there is no disease on these leaflets versus on the right, all three of these leaflets are diseased. And so you can see those lesions inside the yellow circles. A plate like this on the right would be considered to have a disease incidence of 100%. The results here are expressed with disease incidence on the y-axis, and that's a percentage from zero to 100. And then all the treatments are labeled on the x-axis. These will be the results for all 19 isolates uh, ran through the fungicide assay so far. The non-treated is the highest disease incidence as it should be. And then there is a range of incidents in the treatments. Fontellus had the highest disease incidence at over 50%. And then Quintec and Rally were somewhere around 40%. Torino and Flint somewhere in the high teens. And then Luna Sensation was under 5% disease incidence. And this, is, this chart shows all 19 isolates, the results from each individual isolate. I know it's a lot of data to take in. You can see the averages there at the bottom and it's the same significant letters. But what I really wanted to point out here was that there were two isolates from organic production systems. And these isolates were entirely sensitive to every single treatment. So it lines up well because in theory, isolates or mildew that has never been exposed to fungicides should be entirely sensitive to it. And that is what was confirmed here 
with these two organic isolates. In conclusion, I believe that powdery mildew in California is capable of developing resistance to fungicides, and I think this is best supported by the significant differences in efficacy of the treatments when averaged over all 19 isolates, as well as both isolates from organic production being sensitive to all the products as they have not been exposed to fungicide yet. Also, the product with two modes of action, Luna Sensation, worked best, and this falls in line with recommendations from integrated pest management principles, as well as the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee that in order to prevent fungicide resistance, multiple modes of action should be used. And now we'll move on to the host resistance trials. Three trials were performed to evaluate host resistance to powdery mildew. First was a winter trial done from January to February of this year at the Cal Poly Greenhouse. It evaluated 12 cultivars and each cultivar had four pots of four plants each. A summer trial was done in a similar fashion, but from May to June of this year, and it involved 16 cultivars, and we dropped the two Driscoll's cultivars and included a couple more from UC and a couple from Lassen. And then finally, a field evaluation was done on the 10 shared cultivars between the winter and summer trials, and we were fortunate enough to have all these cultivars out in our fields as part of the soil-borne disease resistance trials. The plants for the greenhouse trials were first established in the hoop house at Cal Poly and they were planted in six inch pots in a mixture of peat, perlite, and coconut core and they were overhead irrigated with a shower nozzle on a garden hose for four to five weeks. After that time, they were moved into the greenhouse where an active mildew epidemic was present on more mature plants and they were irrigated via spike emitters. This is what the plants looked like upon transfer into the greenhouse. They were all at the four to five leaf stage and before transfer, each plant was inspected to ensure that it was entirely free of mildew. Each plot was laid out in this two by two fashion as pictured here. And then in between each plot was an inoculum or spreader plant that already had either developed or developing lesions of mildew on it. And so after the transfer, we gave the plants 40 and 41 days in the winter and summer trials respectively to do the ratings. And the important rating here that you should pay attention to is the disease index. And so this was a score calculated from taking the percent of infected leaves per plot and multiplying it by the average severity of each of those infected leaves per plot. And then in the field, we also took disease severity, but instead of looking at each and every leaf, we took five symptomatic leaves from each plot. This is what the ratings looked like in the greenhouse. So I'm going through here and looking at each individual leaf. And if it has mildew present, I'm reading off the percent of the leaf that's colonized by mildew to someone writing down and recording the results behind me. Before I go ahead and show the data from the winter trial, I wanted to point out that on the y-axis, we have disease index, and here that ranges from zero to 25. And then on the x-axis, we have all the cultivar names. So you can see there's quite a range of susceptibility between all the cultivars. Uh, on the most susceptible end, we had BG 3.324 and Royal Royce. And in this trial, these were far and away the most susceptible, at least, double the susceptibility of all the other cultivars. And then on the least susceptible end, we had San Andreas and Sweet Anne. And so as I move through explaining the data from the summer trial and the field evaluation, I want you to pay attention to BG 3.324 and Sweet Anne as those are representative, highly susceptible and low susceptible cultivars. Disease index was also used to rate the cultivars in the summer trial. However, it only goes from zero to 12 in this trial as the susceptibility was generally lower. We still have VG 3.324 as the most susceptible, 
and sweet Anne is on the less susceptible end. However, it is not the least susceptible in this trial of all the cultivars evaluated. You can see Fronteris here is actually the least susceptible. In the field evaluation, the cultivars were evaluated for average severity instead of disease index, but the relative differences are still the same. So again, 3.324 was the most susceptible and Sweet Ann was the least susceptible. So these relative differences mirror pretty well what was found in both the winter and summer trials. With the data from all three trials, I created a chart categorizing every cultivar into four levels of susceptibility, uh, one plus being the least susceptible and four being the most. So we have 3.324 and Royal Royce as the most susceptible. And I included Royal Royce because in that winter trial, it was so much above all the other cultivars up there with BG 3.324. And then on the least susceptible end, we had San Andreas, Sweet Ann, and Fronteris. And then finally, it's important to note that no cultivars showed full resistance. So there was always some mildew on every single cultivar in every single trial. Also, I wanted to point out here Monterey because I know that's the most commonly grown cultivar in the state. And from talking to growers as well as PCAs, it's I know it's generally considered to be susceptible. And although it does get mildew, it in these trials was not as susceptible as a lot of the other cultivars evaluated. All this work was not done alone. So I just wanted to acknowledge a few different groups. I wanted to say thank you to the Strawberry Commission for funding both of these projects. Thank you to Daniel, Miriam, Ignacio, and Mark for helping me collect all these samples for the fungicide assay. I know I pestered you guys a lot and I really appreciate it. And then thank you to my committee for guidance in experimental design and presenting data. And then thank you to Kyle Blauer and Sam Faro for helping me set up the host resistance project. Again, I wanted to thank you all for your time. I'll be live now to answer some questions or if you want to email or call me, I'm happy to respond to either. And Michael's with me live to answer a few questions and to pose one. Michael, go ahead with your polling question. Okay, so the polling question is, what statement about the host resistance trials is true? So we have A, Sweet Ann, San Andreas, and Fronteris were the most susceptible to BG 3.324 and Royal Royce were the least susceptible. Three, Cultivars performed very differently in the field versus the greenhouse. And four, there were no cultivars showing full resistance to powdery mildew. Okay, so three of those statements are false and one of them is true. And you need to vote for the one that you think is true. So we'll give you a few seconds to do that. All right, it well, looks like we've got our answers. 82% of the respondents said it was the last option. There were no cultivars showing full resistance to powdery mildew. Is that right? That is correct, yeah. We, um, we had some cultivars that were very on the low susceptibility end. However, in every single evaluation, there was some mildew infection on each cultivar evaluated. So it's pretty interesting work. You, you've had now two years and you're looking at two different things, both resistance to fungicides and then the host resistance. Uh, as far as the host resistance goes, is there, is there any difference between what's going on on the fruit and what's going on on the leaves? You know, uh, we did not evaluate fruit in this trial, but in the greenhouse trials, when we did have fruit, every single fruit that uh, developed was infected with mildew. So when the leaf pressure is, or when the pressure of the disease on the leaves is rather heavy, it definitely makes its way onto the fruit. Yeah. So we weren't, we just, it wasn't a very reliable way of measuring the disease to actually measure the fruit. Right. Yeah. Everything would have been at 100% uh, disease incidence there. So.
One other thing that I noticed is in the greenhouse, you're touching all the leaves with your hands. Are you actually transferring the disease from one plant to another when you're doing that? So, or, or transferring the spores? Yes, most likely I am transferring the spores. However, it compared to the rate at which the spores transfer through the air, it's negligible. Um, we didn't even go into the greenhouse while the initial inoculation was happening. And after like first symptoms were observed without touching any of the plants. So it's mostly the airborne inoculum that that spreads to the plants. Okay, so yeah, in the greenhouse, there's the fans are on and the spores are sort of moving around in the air at all times, right? Yeah, everything's circulating yeah. there. Okay, so we're ready to go to our next presentation. And for that, our next stop is uh, with Shashika Hewa Vitharana. Shashika? Hello, everyone. My name is Shashika Hevavitarana. I'm one of the plant pathologists at the Kaipali Strawberry Center. I'm going to talk to you about an industry funded project, which is on how soil fumigants affect the soil microbiome over time. Earlier version of this work was presented at Oleg's meeting this year. What is new in this talk is that we have soil microbiome data now. Let's first understand what soil microbiome is. It includes all the microorganisms in a given habitat. For an example, surrounding strawberry roots, there is a rhizosphere microbiome. In our gut, we have gut microbiome. The microbiome typically affects the health of the host. In this project, we wanted to find out how use of four different commercial fumigants affect soil microbiome over time, and if there are organisms that persist and thrive following fumigation. Our aim was to utilize this knowledge in long-term disease management. We measured inoculum levels of Verticillium dallier over time, plant mortality and yield. And we also assessed soil microbiome changes over time. In this study, our treatments were LE33, Dominus, KPM, Trichlor, and no treatment control. We conducted this study in our CalPoly field 25 block 4 that were randomized into six blocks. Each plot was 150 feet long and these were our six blocks. Soil in this field is clay loam and was very difficult to be work with and you can see the soil triangle here. Our experiment started in June 2019. We bedded up and fumigated in June and planted cultivar portola in July. We conducted four marketable yield analysis in October and November 2019 and twice in April this year. We mowed the plants in January. We didn't see a high disease pressure, so we water stretch plants. The experiment was taken down in May. Yellow arrows here show when we sampled soil. Here's a photo when we planted last July. You can see how hard to form our beds was due to the clay loam soil in this site. You might not believe, despite the condition of our beds, 
the plants grew really well. Let's look at Versilium dahlia soil population changes over time. As we know, the threshold of Versilium that can cause Versilium wilt in strawberry is two colony forming units per gram of soil. This is how the soil population changed over time for all the treatments. We saw that in Ali and KPAM, Verticillium soil population significantly declined at time point four compared to its initial uh, level. Despite the Verticillium soil population level above the threshold that requires for disease expression, we saw a minimum level of plant mortality in this trial, which was less than 1%. There was no significant effect on the treatment on plant mortality. This is our marketable yield data. There was no significant difference between treatments again. Our main aim of the project was to look at soil microbiome changes. For that, we sampled soil at five sampling points. However, today I'm only going to show you the first four sampling points. We extracted soil DNA and conducted Illumina sequencing. Basically, you get to see most of the microorganisms such as fungi and bacteria using this method. If we first look at our pathogen, Verticillium dahlia, based on sequencing data, this is how its population changed over time. We looked at many known biocontrol fungi. The good news is that we saw that these fungi amplified after soil fumigation in all the treatments, like in the control treatment. For an example, Arbuscular mycorrhizae that belongs to glomeromycota increased over time. The effect on biocontrol bacteria was not very clear like fungi, but we could see species like Pseudomonas amplifying over time. Again, we have one more time point that we will assess soil microbiome changes at the harvest of plants. However, I don't suspect that the trends would be any different. Take home messages from this study were that soil inoculum level did not predict verticillium wilt and it was inconclusive the fumigant effect against verticillium wilt disease incidence. Also, the fumigant effect on yield was inconclusive. However, we found known biocontrol fungi and bacteria increasing over time after fumigation up to the peak fruit production. With that, I would like to thank all our collaborators the California Strawberry Commission, Trical, Isagro USA, and AMVAC for funding this project. And our technician, Vivian Longacre, and all the students supported this project from the beginning to end. Thank you very much. All right, we're joined now live from San Luis Obispo. We have Shashika via Zoom. Shashika, what is your polling question? My polling question is, what is the threshold of 
verticillium colony forming units per gram of soil that can cause verticillium wilt in strawberry? Is it two, 20, 200 or 2000? Okay, so you have a few seconds now to enter your answers. There's four options there. All right, looks like the poll is finished. Shashika, we've got a spread of, of uh, responses there. It looks like the highest response said 200 colony forming units. Is that correct? Um, it's actually not correct. Uh, for Vercinium built in uh, strawberries, it's actually uh, two uh, microscrotia uh, colony forming units uh, per gram of soil. Um, uh, it's high as 200 um, for lettuce. Um, so the correct answer is two. All right, thank you. We have uh, several questions uh, in the, in the uh, Q&A section. Uh, one says, uh, very interesting. Could you elaborate on how you sampled the soil, sampling depth, composite uh, slash single samples, et cetera? Thanks. Sure. Um, so the first two sampling points, um, pre-treatment, post-treatment were bulk soil samples, uh, one um, foot depth, and then the other uh, two samples were from the rhizosphere of growing plants, and they were um, they came from the rhizos the root zone, which is um, about six uh, inch depth. Um, okay. And we had uh, we had ten plants um, pulled from each rep uh, to go into one uh, block for each treatment. All right, thank you. Although we have two more questions, we're going to have to move to the next presentation to stay on time. But I remind everybody that whatever questions you're putting in, if we aren't able to get to them, we will answer them. Uh, in the in the in the Q and A section of, of of the program, so Shashika has one more presentation. Everyone, my name is Shashika Heva Vitarana. I'm one of the plant pathologists at the Calpoli Strawberry Center. Today I'm going to talk to you about the CalPoly Strawberry Diagnostic Service, our findings and um, the suggestions to submit samples. One of the important tasks of diagnosis is that it helps to decide what to do to control the disease problem. The plant samples can show similar symptoms due to various reasons, including diseases, pests, and herbicide applications. One of the important pieces of solving the puzzle is to provide a representative sample. We don't want samples too dead or too healthy. It is more likely that we find the pathogen in a dying plant like this. Before you send the plants to us, it would be a good idea to cut open the crown and see it yourself. Finding a crown discoloration is common to most of the pathogens that we find, but there are exceptions. Put the sample in a Ziploc bag and label with the name of the field and sampling date. Three plants would be an ideal number to send to us per sample. In order to submit us your sample, go to our website, click on strawberry disease information form, fill out all the fields and send or drop off the sample to the address in the form. Very important that you fill out the submission form so that we know as much as information about the sample and we have a chain of custody. Photos are always welcome. You may wonder what happens to your samples inside our lab. Our students first clean your sample to remove soil, 
and debris, cut open the crown to see crown symptoms, and then disinfect the crown tissue to remove any non-pathogenic microorganisms. Then the crown pieces get plated on specific artificial media. Once plated, those get incubated. In addition to that, we conduct molecular and immunological methods to give you the most accurate results. Then we take observations of the plated samples using microscopes. For an example, this sample was positive for fusarium and this sample was positive for macrophemina. To quickly report to you, sample submissions from this year so far, we received total of 120 samples, mainly from production fields. Majority of these samples came from Santa Maria. A significant percentage of samples were negative for tested pathogens. These plant deaths might have been due to other pathogens that we don't test for, like viruses and phytoplasmas, or abiotic disorders or pest problems. This year, macrophemina and fusarium have been the main causal pathogens so far. With that, I would like to thank the California Strawberry Commission for fully funding this service. We thank all the PCAs and Strawberry Commission staff for facilitating sample submission and field visits. A big thanks for our lab technician, Vivian Longacre, and our students, Angela, Shay, Lauren, and Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Shashika. Our final stop on the program is the moment you've been waiting for, the big reveal. Uh, can I get a drum roll, please? <laughs> just, just kidding, but we, we are, we're excited to announce our, our new entomologist joining us at Strawberry Center. Uh, this is uh, Sarah Zukoff. She is joining us from uh, Garden City, Kansas and she has a presentation and then we'll join her for a live Q&A via Kansas and via Zoom. All right, Sarah. My name is Dr. Sarah Zukoff and I am the new entomologist at the Strawberry Research Center at Cal Poly. I am coming to you from Kansas State University right now where I am, but in about two weeks I will be at Cal Poly. And right now you can see the corn behind me. I am actually in a Kansas cornfield um, and I'll be doing this presentation from Kansas, but very soon I'll be there in person and I hope to meet you all. Thank you. Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my background. First, I'm from South Georgia, and I received my bachelor's and my master's degree from Georgia Southern University, where I worked on spiders, ticks, and sand flies. While there, I concurrently worked at the University of Georgia on several crops as a crop consultant. Then I went to the University of Missouri, where I got my PhD and worked on corn under the USDA ARS plant genetics unit from there, I went to Kansas State University and worked as a associate professor in field crop entomology. And from there, went to California. Uh, now I'll be at the Cal Poly Strawberry Research Center. Well, that's enough about me. Now on to the research I wanted to present today. This work was conducted last year by Peter Shearer, my predecessor, and our entomology technician, Jose Alvarado Rojas. This work looked at the quality of commercially produced predatory mites that are used for spider mite control. Throughout the many crops I've worked on, spider mites have been of particular interest to me, and I've studied them for many years. I'm looking forward to working on spider mites now and with the farmers who work in strawberries. Since two spotted spider mites are important pests of strawberries, I wanted to mention a little bit about them and the damage that they can inflict. These mites have a very fast reproductive rate where they can lay lots of eggs and under warm temperatures can complete their life cycle in as little as one week. 
all that feeding and reproducing quickly dries the plant out, which can lead to a reduction in strawberry yield. They usually can cause stippling, scarring, and bronzing of the leaves. Here's a nice video that Jose took. This is up close on a leaf. You can really see where their feeding damage has occurred. All those little stippling and spotted areas. One of the ways that farmers manage spider mites is by using predatory mites. These good guy mites can be purchased from commercial sources and are usually either one of two species. One of them is Phytocelius persimilis and the other one is Neocelius californicus. These and other species of predatory mites sometimes occur naturally and in some areas have already been established. Here's another nice video by Jose. You can see a predatory mite feeding on a two-spotted spider mite here. The predatory mite is orange and shiny and resembles a classic piece of hard candy, while the spider mite is smaller and has a softer body that isn't shiny. Now the predatory mite latches on with its fang-like mouthparts and will continue to feed on the spider mite until it's basically dry. It will leave the discarded shriveled husk and go search for another as soon as it's done with this one, which is why they make such good predators. Here you can see the strawberry covered in pest mites and their webbing. Now since these spider mites can cause a lot of damage in strawberries, farmers will order the predatory mites and place them in the strawberry fields with the expectation that the predators will clean up the spider mites. These mites can work in tandem with some chemicals or by themselves, depending on the farmer's practice. However, what the farmers were seeing were lots of areas that the spider mites would just keep reproducing and causing damage. So what's going on? What's happening with these predators? So Peter and Jose decided to investigate the quality of the predatory mites that the farmers were purchasing. So I will be uh, presenting their results. This work was funded by the California Strawberry Commission. The specific objectives of this study were to assess the abundance within the containers and to see if it was accurately depicted on the label. To also see if the females were reproducing and actually producing eggs and to see if they survived and if their babies survived and if the mites actually appeared healthy. For this work, three standard quality perimeters were used. For both species, the amount of mites in the shipped container must exceed the amount listed on the label. The second parameter was that 80% of the predatory mites must be alive in each container. The third one is that the predatory mites must lay a certain number of eggs per female, and this is to ensure that they will continue reproducing in the field after they are released. Now in these strawberry fields, healthy predatory mites should have no trouble continuing to live happily and reproducing. If all these three parameters are met, then a container would be considered acceptable quality and considered worth the money. If not, it is unacceptable. They categorized predatory mites as either gravid or pregnant females or males and immatures, so those that are reproducing versus those that are not. The chunks of debris in these pictures are vermiculite and are the substrate used to house and ship the predatory mites. The small red dots in the circles are the predatory mites. To do this work, you need to quickly identify each life stage of the mite by sight, which is kind of difficult. A phytocelius mite can consume around seven adult spider mites in one day, or 20 immature spider mites in one day, or 25 spider mite eggs in one day. And generally, there are around four females for every one male you find in a healthy population. Now, the females are generally larger and darker than the males. You can see the male at the bottom, it's smaller and lighter colored than the female. So in addition to counting the predatory mites in each shipment, they also started noticing stressed mites. So what does a stressed mite look like, you might ask yourself. Well, they look discolored, can be white, cream, or even darker than normal color. 
These mites will often have a lower egg laying rate and will not eat as much as a healthy predatory mite. They also might have a large rectal plug, which unfortunately gets stuck on the leaves and they could die. So here you can see the adult predatory mite and here is the predatory mite egg, which is oval shaped. And here is the spider mite egg, which is circular. And you can see this predatory mite actually starting to feed on that spider mite egg. So what did they find? Well, let's look at the predatory mite Phytocelis persimilis first. Recall that the first quality parameter was that the abundance of the predatory mites within the container must exceed what was on the label. Now here you can see the 25 containers of commercial predatory mites they received, and unfortunately only three of these actually met this quality parameter. The next parameter was that 80% of the predatory mites must be alive in the samples in order for it to be considered a quality sample. So of these 25 that they received, they were only able to measure the survival ship in 17 of the containers, but out of those 17, only two actually met this quality parameter. So the third quality parameter was that each female had to lay at least 10 eggs per female. Now of the 25 that were received, again, only 17, they were able to look at fecundity or the amount of eggs that were laid per female. And you can see everything that's above the yellow line, there's only 10 of them. So 10 of the 17 that they were able to measure actually met this quality parameter. Now let's switch to Neocelis californicus and look at what they found for those mites. So here, they looked at the quality parameter for the abundance. So did the abundance within the container meet or exceed what was actually written on the label? And so if you look at these, they were only able to receive seven of these containers, but four of them actually met this parameter. So of the containers they received, they were able to measure survival ship on three of these containers. And so one of the three actually met the 80% or more survival per container. Uh, so that's kind of low. And the third parameter was to measure fecundity or the amount of eggs laid per female. And for this species, they were supposed to be laying seven eggs or more per, per female. And uh, what they found was two of the three uh, containers actually met this parameter. So in summary, only one container out of the 32 bottles met all quality parameters. And less than a quarter of the containers met their labeled abundance. So there's more work to be done with this. So I would like to thank Peter and Jose for conducting this assessment. And I would like to thank the Strawberry Commission for funding this work. I hope to pick up where they left off and continue to look at predatory mites and problems associated with the release in strawberry fields. Sarah, thank you for making that presentation. We know it's not your, your data, but uh, it was really impactful to hear those results. Now, you look like you're joining us. I think that's a virtual background, but <laughs> Where are you actually? I'm in Garden City, Kansas. Okay. And when are you beginning work here at Cal Poly? Starting Monday. Okay. So a lot of stuff going to happen between now and Monday. Indeed. <laughs> You've got a polling question. You want to pose that question? Sure. So how many predatory mite containers in the study met all standardized quality parameters? Was it one, four, eight, or 32? All right, give everybody a few seconds to enter your answers. All right, looks like we have the answers. Sarah, can you see that, the, the response to the poll? Yes, I do. It was kind of across the board, um, but number of uh, containers that actually met was one. <laughs> Unfortunately, only one of the containers met all three of the quality parameters. 
And it looks like most people got that right, 62%. Yep. All right, so we do have a, a, a question from our audience I'd like to pose. Uh, one of our, I just got a second one, but are the beneficials quality checked upon receipt? What vendors did you use and have you compared amongst different vendors, Copert, BioBest, Beneficial Insectary, et cetera? So that's a really good question. Um, there were several vendors that we used. Um, we did not reveal which vendor was which in this uh, preliminary study right now. Um, but there's more work to be done on that. And for, uh, what was the first part of that question What again? about the quality of the sample that you're getting? How yes. are you getting it? Yes. Yeah, so I, we... I shouldn't say you, Jose and Peter. <laughs> yeah, my predecessor and Jose um, received the containers from, uh, the farmers had received them and then they were transferred. Um, the Strawberry Commission helped us with the communication in that. Um, and so we got them right as soon as the farmers got them. Um, so they were shipped to the farmer like normal. Um, and there was little to no delay into the lab getting them and going through the samples. Um, so we went with the shipping directly to the farmer for this. So yeah, we understand that the handling of that is very important and tried to eliminate those variables. Mm -hmm. That's all the time we have question, all the questions we have time for. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us. And thanks to everybody for joining us on our virtual field day today. I wanna thank all of our speakers, all of you for joining. Thank our, thanks again to our sponsors. For the continuing education units, you'll be getting an email from us. Um, the handouts, I want to remind you that the handouts that were available today are online for each of the presentations. You have contact information and detailed uh, bar charts, et cetera. So please check that out. Uh, this event was recorded, so you'll have access to it at a future date. We'll, when that's available, probably within the week, we'll send out an email to all of the people who RSVP'd. Um, so that's it, that concludes our program. Thank you all and have a great day.